and my goal is to take the plane around to different um, high schools, you know, by going to different airports and meeting with different groups and allow the kids and aspiring pilots to physically see the plane, you know, that set the records over the poles, to touch it, to get inside it. Um, Good morning. This is a very special webinar. It's not so much tax information or vessel information or aircraft information as it is I'm checking in with a friend of mine who's doing a very, very good thing for the planet. He's flying from pole to pole. He has, he's gonna tell you about his mission and his mission statement and some of the things he's had to overcome already. Uh, but first, I wanna play a little uh, video that I made to explain to everyone what I do. Welcome to another Aero Marine free webinar. Let me tell you who we are. We help people who are buying aircraft, vessels, and vehicles to legally avoid the California tax. Just because you're a non-resident of California doesn't mean you're not subject to their assessment. So be smart about all of that. This is, we do these for you because we're trying to give you free information. We do this all the time because you need it, because you've asked for it. And if you've got any subjects that you'd like us to cover that you haven't heard us cover in the past, just send me an email or send an email to Kelsey or call us at 916-691-9192 and we'll get you the information that you asked for. Now, if things go a little clinky today, I'll take total responsibility for that. The reason is, is that the software that, that we use to run these webinars was just updated and nobody asked me my opinion about anything. So now I have to figure out how it all works. So we go to here. I have to close that. I want to introduce to you Robert De Laurentiis, and uh, this is his project, and I'm going to let him tell you about it. But first of all, I want to tell you that if you're on here and you want to ask questions, just send a text us, and he will answer the questions. Don't try to wait till the end, because there's so much uh, information in here that, it, in other words, ask us the question as soon as you have it, so that we can kind of keep all this in real time. So with no further ado, here's Robert. Hey, Tom, thanks for having me on again. You know, as you were playing your video, I was thinking about the fact that you've actually helped me purchase what was the uh, spirit of San Diego and also the citizen of the world. So you've uh, played a big part in making these trips happen. So thanks so much for that. And this is no our, second, our second time talking, this time live, last time uh, just audio. But, um, you know, the, the polar circumnavigation is a very different animal than an equatorial circumnavigation. And certainly there've been some people doing those uh, in the recent past. And when we prepared for the trip around the equator back in 2015, I remember spending about six months working on that trip. And we came into this one with a bigger team, a more experienced team, and certainly, you know, the, uh, the experience of going around the world once. And I thought, well, maybe six months on this one because it's a little bit more complicated. Right now, we're at 21 months uh, in terms of preparing for the trip and um, very humbled by how challenging this is. Um, you know, we are 100 percent dedicated to making it happen. And you'll see some of the details of the trip uh, in this presentation that we'll run through and hopefully in the, the questions that I'll answer. But um, definitely a different animal. And what I want to do is um, maybe I'll start out with uh, I see some of the people on the list of attendees that I know, but um, I'm Robert De Laurentiis, and uh, back in 2015, as I mentioned, we did this uh, circumnavigation in a plane called the Spirit of San Diego. We declared it a success, and I think our sponsors agreed. We had over 100 television, um, TV, radio, newspaper, internet interviews, and that led to really two years of lecturing on what we learned during that trip. We had uh, about 40 sponsors on that trip. We have 85 on this one, including aero uh, and marine tax professionals. And what I want to do is start off with a video that we put together. It's a two minute teaser, but it really sums up the trip pretty nicely. So let's see if our techno technology agrees with us here. 
you know, when you look at the world today, there's so many things that separate people. I think that the world needs something that joins people together. And this trip is exactly that. The purpose of the mission is to connect the South Pole and the North Pole and everybody in between. The reason I call the plane the citizen of the world is it's named after a blog that I did back in 2015. During my trip, I found that there are more similarities than differences amongst people. What everybody on the planet seemed to want was peace, safety for their family, financial stability, joy and happiness. And I found those to be the common threads that really sort of unite everybody together. There are definitely elements of this trip that I'm afraid of that scare me. Taking an aircraft that's designed to go 2,000 nautical miles and taking it to 5,000 is something that requires so many modifications. Being up in the air for over 20 hours in this aircraft over remote parts of the planet where you know help is unlikely to come. It really takes an enormous number of people working together to make a trip like this happen. Traveling to the ends of the earth is an enormously complicated and ambitious task, but we're up for this epic trip. The benefits to STEM education, aviation, safety, and technology all make it worth the enormous risk. It's one planet, one people, one plane. I'm Robert DeLorenis, Zen Pilot, and I'm the pilot for the citizen of the world. So, Tom, you see in that opening slide, uh, the time frame was 2018 to 2019. That was um, when we were very optimistic and we weren't 100 percent in tune with uh, all the challenges we were going to encounter. And it's really interesting because I was ready to go in November of 2018, but the plane was definitely not. And it started talking to us. We had um, the windshield crack up at 30,000 feet. That's an interesting experience, you know, as you watch um, the crack starting to expand in a pressurized cabin, just sort of wondering what's going to happen. But um, we're definitely getting closer. The engines were talking to us, too. We just replaced some fuel controllers on it. Actually, they were rebuilt by Honeywell. And uh, we're about to do some flight testing, um, not this week, but next week on Monday. And we'll be testing the environmental system. That, that had a little bit of a hiccup as well. But this is uh, the citizen of the world. Um, the reason why we call it the citizen of the world was because back in 2015, when I was traveling to these different countries, I came to realize that there were actually more similarities than differences amongst people. And, you know, when I left, um, I was, you know, defining people by their color, their ethnicity, their religion, their socioeconomic class. And what I came to realize was that, you know, people wanted the same things. They wanted uh, safety and security, health, happiness, you know, the pursuit of uh, joy and happiness. And that was sort of a common thread that joined everybody. And that's how we came up with the name Citizen of the World. And on this trip, we're going to be a document, do, doing a documentary. Uh, part of it is filmed in 8K, which is double what you'd find in the theaters today. And um, we're excited about that because we'll be doing aerial photo shoots over Alaska, Switzerland, Chile, and Southern California. And we hope to interview people about what it means to be a citizen of the world. Here's some uh, quick trip details. It's again, 26,000 nautical miles, which is the circumference of the earth. And it's not a very direct route, so it's probably gonna be a bigger number than that. And the actual trip will take about five or six months. And that's because when you have 24 hours of daylight in the warmest time of the year at the North Pole, it takes six months for it to shift to the South Pole. So we're expecting a long trip. And, you know, when you prepare for a, um, a polar expedition, as the State Department calls this, for such a long time, it makes sense to do it right, to talk to a lot of people along the way and have as much global impact as you can. One of our uh, supporters is, of course, AOPA. I mean, what could we do in general aviation without them? But this will celebrate their 80th anniversary. And this is um, a decal we have on the nose of the plane. And it's signed by all the senior officials at AOPA, which I'm really proud to have their involvement. And directly behind that, you can see an infrared sensor 
Um, it's the first time a GA turbine commander has ever flown with one. So at those moments in time when it's uh, dark out there in the world, whoops, um, that'll be providing us with a better view of the Earth. Here's a rough uh, view of the route. This has changed actually since we made this slide um, and it'll continue to change uh, on a daily basis, quite honestly. But we'll start off in San Diego, head north, up into Alaska, then over the North Pole, uh, into Norway, down through Europe, Africa, and then cross over to South America, Natali, Brazil, excuse me, then down to the tip of uh, Chile. And as recently as last week, we shifted the departure point from Punta Arenas uh, over into uh, Ushuaia in Argentina. It's a little bit closer, uh, slightly longer runway. The concern, though, is that there are mountains around that point. And when the plane takes off at 40% over max gross, I definitely don't want to be making any turns, you know, as I climb. And I'll have an extra 935 gallons of Jet A1 as opposed to Jet A, which you typically find in the U.S. Jet A1 gels at minus 47 Celsius, whereas uh, Jet A gels at minus 40. Um, and then you would ask yourself, you know, why this plane? And part of the reason is money, right? I uh, lectured at Scale Composites um, a couple years ago. And I was talking to the engine, engineers there, and I said, how much to build me a plane that could do this trip? And they said the cost to build a new plane is about a billion dollars. And we didn't have a billion dollars in the uh, budget, Tom. So I went into the commercial market and looked at a lot of different twin turbo props. And I wanted uh, turbine engines because they're supposedly 100 times more reliable than a piston engine. And in my first uh, trip around the world, my piston engine failed 14,000 feet over the Strait of Malacca. So I thought I want more reliability. I'm not willing to take that risk anymore. And I'll take two turbines instead of one. And this plane um, is a remarkable plane. The thing that really drives it is this the, the engines or the Honeywell TPE 331-10Ts. And where you may have heard about these engines is that they're on Predator drones. And they're probably one of the most um, reliable, efficient turboprops in the world today. It's in part due because they have a geared drive. So they're directly connected to the turbine and that gives them some additional efficiency. So each one of these engines puts out the same horsepower as a Pilatus PC-12, but it uses about half the fuel. So I have double the horsepower with the same fuel burn. The other thing is, is it has an enormous tail. So when you lose one of the engines, you can just make a trim adjustment and the plane flies pretty reliably. And in testing, we had an issue where one of the engines, we couldn't get it restarted. And I landed it on one engine and it was actually quite easy in this plane. And it's all due to that enormous tail. The other advantage is that it has a huge, can you see um, my little arrow, Tom, as I scroll around? Absolutely. The okay, Absolutely. Good. Okay. So, Inside this huge cabin, you can put fuel tanks. And in the other planes, like the King Airs, they're not as big. Um, there's the Conquest that's not as big. But inside here, we plan to add another six fuel tanks for a total of 10. And let's not uh, ignore these huge, you know, beautiful five-bladed nickel tip scimitar composite MT props. And I went directly to them and said, hey, here's my mission you guys did a great job with my last plane and designing a prop. Now I need one that's efficient at 35,000 feet, that can climb quickly, that's, you know, light, starts up faster, better uh, prop clearance over the ground because it's shorter, because it has more blades. It doesn't need to be longer. And this is what they came up with. And, you know, it was interesting because some of the engineers told me that it wouldn't work and that Hartzell had tried something like this on the Turbine Commander and the plane had crashed. And they dropped the project, but um, you know these props have exceeded what we expected for them, and they're actually sold out now for six months. So MT is very, very happy. Um, I love this picture of the plane because it shows you why it's so special on this trip. You see the you know TPE engines, you see the huge MT props, you see the big passenger compartment where all the fuel goes, and then you see this very, very long. Gulfstream wing and Gulfstream bought the rights uh, from Rockwell 
to build the plane and they made their improvements, which included, you know, pressurizing the cabin to a, um, a higher pressure, um, you know, adding the wing. There was a bunch of stuff they did. They dropped the uh, cabin um, floorboard by four inches to make more space. So these are some of the reasons that I just mentioned. And the other thing is that is the wing that I talked about, right? So Gulfstream put their wing on the plane and I was lucky in that I was able to find the engineer from Gulfstream who actually designed, designed the wing. His name was Fred Gatz and we did a feasibility study and he told me exactly how heavy I could make the plane. And he came up with the 40% over max gross, which adds the 935 ga gallons of fuel inside the cabin. And it tells me that I can do it reliably, you know, without taking extreme risk. Um, other modifications, uh, we put in a new environmental system that has a higher uh, heat and cooling capacity because that 935 gallons of fuel that we're carrying inside the plane needs to be heated. It's also lighter. It uses less bleed air. LED lights, right, because we want to be seen. They use less power as well. Concord batteries have been tested um, in Antarctica. These AMSAFE airbags that I put into my first plane, the Spirit of San Diego, I don't know if you know, but it crashed and the pilot and the passenger survived. And I talked to him and he said without the airbags, he would not have lived. So we definitely wanted to put those into the plane. We have an efficient way to charge the batteries when it's in a hangar. We um, eliminated the step that you use to get into the passenger compartment because it was a source of leaks. We didn't want to deal with that. We'll have cameras inside the plane uh, so that I can do some interviews because Eric Lindbergh is riding along on the leg of, on a leg of the trip. We have um, Yurka, the VP of marketing from AOPA. Uh, there's different people, you know, that will join me on different legs. And we want to kind of make it like the Seinfeld show. I don't know if you've seen it on Netflix where he's riding in classic cars with comedians to coffee shops. This is going to be kind of the, the pilot version. Um, so we're looking forward to doing that. Um, and then the temperature of fuel is so important because jet a fuel gels. And since I'll be up at 35,000 feet, hopefully over the poles, um, we've found that a year in advance, it was minus 67 and the operating limits of the plane, uh, are lower than that. So we need to be very in tune with, you know, what altitude I'm at, what the outside air temperature is. We actually have. Uh, two gauges for that, and then we have another gauge we're installing for the actual fuel before it goes into the fuel pump, just after the comes out of the inboard tank, um, and before it goes into a heat exchanger, because that's the most vulnerable vulnerable point where the fuel could actually gel. Uh, higher bias tires, since um, you know we're carrying so much weight, and then just uh, we reduce the center console to make a little more space for the plane or for the pilot. Um, this was a slide to show you the, the power of the turbine commander, and you got a little bit of that in the teaser, so we'll skip that. And, you know, as a pilot, Tom, you, you know there are pilots that like to just keep an eye on their plane and, you know, make them museum quality inside their hangars. There's other pilots that just like to be up in the air. Um, I'm one of those pilots who loves to push buttons, and my panel was specifically designed for this polar mission. So, you know, for the people watching, I'd ask them, you know, what if you had the ideal panel that you could design, what would it look like? And here's what mine looks like. The only difference is we're installing HUD displays, one here and one here, and that's for angle of attack. There's been a lot of discussion about angle of attack right after the 737s, the Boeings went down. Um, that's optional equipment, but it'll definitely be installed on this plane. Just looking at this, um, we pulled out the Garmin avionics and put in Avidyne, and there's a number of reasons for that. It's really, a, I think, a smart decision. One is that we have knobs in addition to a touchscreen. So if it gets really cold inside the plane, the touchscreen would not potentially work. So I can default to the knobs. The other thing is that Avidyne uses a different coordinate system uh, to navigate. So you don't lose your navigation over the poles. Garmin system is notorious for losing navigation where all the meridians come together. And we're not expecting that to happen with this system. Um, we will take some precautions. Nonetheless, we've installed, you can't quite see it. It's a directional gyro so that I can dead reckon across the poles if I need to. 
And we'll also put a waypoint before the poll and after the poll, which makes the actual poll not something that the unit has to calculate. And if all that sort of goes south, then I'm going to keep an eye on the position of the sun and take uh, that line of position on my outbound and then reverse it on the inbound leg. We have um, synthetic vision on the Avidines um, and also on this backup L3 indicator. Um, we have satellite communications. That's the Delorum up here that you see. Also, I have satellite music. You can't quite see it over here. That only works in the US and Canada through Sirius XM. Um, you can see that there's steam gauges, but there's also um, touchscreen glass panel, you know, the absolute uh, latest technology. And it's just nice to have a very basic backup, kind of like we were talking about before the show. You know, Charles Lindbergh's panel was pretty, pretty basic. And the less complicated, the less uh, chance for something to fail. Here's an iPad cooler for when I'm in um, Africa. We have a bunch of USB ports that we added. That's for tracking units that the Federation Aeronautique International uses to help confirm that we've actually set speed and distance records over the poles. Um, here's a more complete uh, list of all the little uh, gadgets we have. We also upgraded the plane to RVSM, reduced vertical separation minima, and that's so the plane can fly at 35,000 feet. Um, let's see what else we have in here. I'm adding an HF radio, which is required for some of those long transitions. Um, higher powered radios. A lot of the radios that you buy today can be unlocked and they have more power so you can, you know, transmit your signal a little bit further. And I think I got most of this here. We're going to talk about the experiment that we're adding to the plane. Um, yeah, this is pretty much a lot of it here. We're also going to have the uh, Iridium Go using the Iridium satellite network. And probably maybe one of the most important things, Tom, is ADSB out. Um, that'll be tracked by the new Iridium Next satellites um, globally for the first time in the history of man. So we're working with Iridium and uh, Arion right now to do that. We're really pretty excited about that. That's pretty cool stuff. Um, all right. So we've talked about some of the issues, uh, navigation, right? Um, and then all the extra fuel that I'll be carrying. But there's a lot of issues for a polar circumnavigation that you would never experience on an equatorial circumnavigation. Uh, some of those things uh, are, of course, the fuel. And this is probably my biggest concern right now. I've been talking to a few people about Pris, which basically pulls the moisture out of the fuel and surrounds it, and then it drops it to the bottom of the tank and hopefully either um, drain it out before the flight or it gets pulled through, but it can't, it prevents the water from freezing and closet or uh, clogging the fuel injectors. We talked about the warm cabin, the temperature sensors. Um, and then the other thing is we found a route through the wing root of the plane. So the fuel will be inside the cabin getting heated. And then there's a direct line through the wing route into the inboard tank. And then to that fuel sensor, the fuel pump, the heat exchanger and then into the engine. Originally, they were planning on routing the fuel outside the structure of the plane, which was a terrible idea because it's going to be exposed to all that cold air. Here's the route that um, we have now. I haven't adjusted this to Ushuaia, which is right down here, but you can see we're going to do a direct route all the way to the pole and then actually all the way back on this line right here. And I've charted out every possible place for me to land along the way. And you see some of these uh, say ski only. So that's a white ice runway. And then other ones say blue ice or blue. And that's basically snow that's been compacted so much that you can land a wheeled vehicle on it. And there's a joke that I make, you know, people say, well, where can you land? And I say, well, I can land anywhere once. It's just taking off. You know, <laughs> that's the challenge. Um, here's one of the calculations that we did for the fuel tanks. This is what we're submitting to the FAA. And this was uh, done by Fred Gatz. He's the guy who uh, designed the wing for um, Gulfstream. It's since been bought out, by the way, by Twin Commander. Here's uh, the people that are involved in this project. Um, these are some pretty special people here. Um, actually, I love all of these guys. 
Tim Nealon. He has been doing survival training uh, since the Vietnam War. And, you know, we've met personally. I've been to many of his classes. He's putting together my survival bag. Uh, Brian Keating, he has a um, microwave telescope called Bicept at the South Pole. And he's the guy who tells me what time of the year to go. He's uh, put me in touch with the NASA uh, scientists. We've got our global peace advisor because, as you mentioned, Tom, this is bigger than just aviation, right? We're connecting the two places on the planet, the North and South Pole, where peace actually exists. And we're trying to connect everybody in between on this mission of global peace when, when the world is divided. So he's the guy I go to with all the peace issues. Jolie Lucas is, um, I'm sure you know her. She's a good friend and a uh, psychotherapist. So if I get into situations like I did on the first trip where, you know, I have an engine out and a little post-traumatic stress <laughs> trying to get out of Malaysia or some other place, I'm not going to Malaysia this time, but, you know, dealing with the issues that pilots have to deal with. Um, she's somebody I can call. Mike Jesh, he's been helping me with a lot of things, but I brought him on board because I want help looking at the weather at the South Pole and making that go, no-go decision. Uh, Eddie Gold is an amazing guy. He has moved more planes around the planet than just about anybody I know. And he's not one of these big companies. He charges fifty dollars a country whereas you know some of the companies that are helping move planes around are charging three thousand dollars for each stop so uh invaluable guy to have with a ton of experience and then susan gilbert and mary mark dante are probably the bigger biggest players in this um you can see their social media community outreach mary does a lot of my editing but when we have our tough decisions to make i'm always talking with them very spiritual ladies that are guiding me as well I honestly couldn't do it without them. We talked about the magnetic compass part. Here's a good slide. You know, I don't know that a lot of people know this. There's the geographic North Pole and South Pole and then the magnetic North and South Pole. And it's changing. The magnetic pole changes every day. So I actually am going to be going to the geographic North Pole and South Pole. Um, and this is divided by quite a distance. Uh, and there's a lot of things that go into that, like you have to shift your GPS unit from magnetic to true, and it's at a different point on the planet when, planet when you're going north as compared to south. So definitely a consideration. Um, whiteout conditions over the poles. Here's our Shaden Zen Flip sunglasses. They actually work really well just as a regular GA pilot because when you're climbing above the clouds, right, the sun is much brighter above, so you can flip the top um, filtration or lenses down on top of the bottom ones so it makes them darker or when you're flying below the clouds and it's not as bright you can just use the bottom ones um, we designed those spe especially for the trip the other thing is pilot fatigue uh, the flight right now is about 17 and a half hours and you know there's a lot of things you can do to stay busy there's a guy named bill harrelson who did the trip in a different class of plane. I believe it was a Lance Air he was in. And his flight was 24 hours. But I asked him, I said, you know, how, how do you stay awake for a trip like that? And he goes, you know, Robert, I was never sleepy because I was afraid the entire time. But, you know, I know from my past circumnavigation that uh, you stay pretty busy. Um, you know, you design sort of a workout for inside the plane to keep your blood flowing, uh, wearing compression socks. Uh, monitoring the engines, temperatures, because you want to, you know, if something's starting to get hotter, you want to know about it in advance. You don't want it just to get to the, the red line on the engine. Um, and then I mentioned Bill's method, chewing gum, you know, keeping the blood flowing. That actually works pretty well. Uh, here's some of the uh, polar issues that we've discussed. Let's see, we've gotten through all these. The other thing is the vast distances. We're looking at about 4,500 nautical miles. And the thing about the plane is we don't actually know what its true range is. You know, we've done all these modifications. We've added all this fuel, but nobody knows how efficiently it's going to fly. You know, what that angle of attack will be through the air. And it's kind of like a speedboat. When you start out, it sort of bogs down a little bit, trying to get up on top of the water. And then finally, you get above the water, and then it goes faster. So we're going to be doing some testing of the plane um, before I depart. Now, in terms of looking for the potential problems, the weakest link 
is something I talk about in my presentations. And there's the weakest part of the aircraft, and then there's the most likely part um, of the trip to cause a failure. The weakest part of the aircraft, surprisingly, is the tires. And we have higher ply tires on the mains, which carry most of the weight. But the weakest part of this mission is actually going to be me. And if you think about pilot error, we all know that that's the most likely thing that causes accidents. So that's why I'm trying to go through all these different you know, scenarios and anticipate the problems. I'm not really concerned so much about the things that I can anticipate. It's the surprises that happen, you know, that you have to think quickly and maybe you didn't, um, didn't consider. So just, you know, rolling through personal preparations. Here's something that most pilots don't do. They don't go to survival classes. And I think that's as important as recurrent training and guys like Tim Nealon, uh, corporate air parts. Um, there's a few different, um, companies out there uh that do uh training and they're certainly worth seeking out i've actually been in one of the tanks tom where they turn out the lights and you're in a simulated uh cockpit and they flip it upside down in the darkness and then they submerge in the water you need to get out and unleash your um and find your way plane undo the hatch in the darkness uh out of court and the fear piece is a big part of this. And I have to say, you know, that if you're not losing sleep over a trip like this, you're probably not into all the different possibilities, you know, the things that can happen. Um, having corrective surgery, having the experience of, you know, doing this before is a huge advantage. And then figuring out the parts of your body that might be a distraction. So if you, it sounds silly, but, you know, maybe you have an ingrown toenail that every time you push on the rudder pedals, you experience some amount of pain. Well, that's the thing you have to go after and get that fixed so you're not distracted by that. Um, having the best headset you could possibly have, for me, it's the Lightspeed uh, PFX or the Zulu 3 or, um, you know, whatever is the latest technology that, that they have. And then we talked about team support and how are you outfitted. I have some Lyft Aviation uh, flying shoes. Um, you know, I'm going to have uh, a custom lift helmet at some point here if we can get it to market uh, soon enough i think i have a maybe a picture here oh no i don't but anyway the the helmets um are a big part of all this so how are you outfitted for what you might experience and then this is a topic that most people sort of get a little uncomfortable with it's the discussion of survival and really when you consider you know what your risks are people go to this and for me, when I did my equatorial circumnavigation, the people that did the trip before me, they didn't make it. They crashed out of American Samoa, uh, the Suleimans, and they found the boy who had just gotten his IFR license. He actually didn't have his card yet, but it was on the you know piece of paper that he had been given by his examiner. But they never found the father and some end of the way. So, you know, when you start considering your chances for survival, if you down, it's, it's, it's a concern, you know, the funny thing is, is the guy that did the trip before me, this, um, polar trip, I asked him, I said, you know, what gear carry? And he actually carried no survival gear because he figured that an extra gallon of fuel was worth more to him than the survival gear. And probably one of the most experienced ferry pilots on the planet, a guy named Fred Sorensen, uh, he doesn't carry survival gear either. Uh, I am carrying survival gear, <laughs> despite what everybody else is doing. The, um, the other thing is we're carrying a NASA experiment and it's a wafer scale spaceship. And it's pretty cool. Here's a picture of it. The uh, scientists from uh, UC Santa Barbara have been contracted by NASA to construct this. And the theory is that in the future, you're not going to send a rocket with a rocket motor and, you know, thousands of gallons of rocket fuel into space with a command module when a circuit board that can take so much more stress than a human pilot can actually, you know, be sent out into space and blast these, or they hope to be able to blast them out into outer space every 15 minutes. So the, you know, the save is enormous and they seem to think that rocket rockets are going to be a thing of the past in the future. So, 
and it actually collects information as well. So, um, you know, GPS position, it has the ability to communicate. We were originally going to use the um, Iridium network, and now they're talking about some high frequency communication, uh, inertial navigation, temperature sensor, and uh, it could actually take pictures as well. And so let's talk a little bit about social media, Tom. Um, obviously, you guys are in tune with this. We're doing a podcast, but, you know, everybody talks about how you're going to reach the next generation. And the next generation is on social media. So therefore we have to be on social media. And, you know, we've made a huge effort uh, in terms of uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, what used to be Google Plus. And now our next push is on YouTube and making videos that are, you know, interesting out in the world. And this is, I think, gonna be the way we're gonna get people excited about aviation. And I'll be vlogging and blog for AOPA uh, and we're going to be broadcasting some of those. Uh, here's the places you can find us. That's available on our website. Let's see one. There we go. And then in support of the trip, because we don't want to just be asking sponsors for money, we've been coming up with products that support us. Here's our uh, commemorative coin. These are serialized. And we have a smaller version of this that we'll take on the plane. So you'll actually be able to buy a coin that's flown around the world over the poles. We talked about the sunglasses, and I hope most people have heard about Zen Pilot Flight of Passion and the Journey Within by now. Uh, here's the DVD we did in conjunction with Glime on overcoming the fear of flying, and the McGavick High School class that's part of the AOPA High School Education Program that's using Redbird simulators to fly around the world will read Zen Pilot to learn about the challenges that a circumnavigation actually entails, you know, above and beyond steering the plane. And then since that book is pretty raw, they'll watch the video, <laughs> hopefully if it, they get a little scared to help them move past that. Uh, we have World Passports. Those are actually um, through a company that helps people that don't have documentation um, so that they can travel internationally, a lot of refugees. And that's usable in some countries, not places like the US, France, or Canada, but a lot of other countries accept them. Then there's our first book. Uh, we have commemorative uh, stamps that uh, are pretty cool. They actually, uh, I use those in all our, our letters and I am signing those and serializing them as well. And then here's something we haven't told a lot of people about, the little plane that could and it's about a plane that uh, grows up to become a turbine commander and flies to a lot of different countries meeting people and you know eventually it'll learn that everybody is just one we have our coloring books two of them uh compression socks and there's a brief story i'll tell you about this one of my good buddies john kunis who was the uh one of the owner operators of pilot getaways passed away back in 2015. i had departed on my equatorial circumnavigation he was flying from uh, Oakland to Brunei and he had a pulmonary embolism after the trip and died and we believe that had he been wearing compression socks like most pilots should on their longer legs that he would have survived so we're now selling these through aircraft spruce and of course all the money that we raise from my presentations and from these products go to the De Laurentiis Foundation which is a 501c3 it's helping to fund the trip but it also will help fund scholarships for kids so they don't have to wait until they're 47 like I was to learn how to fly. They can start learning, you know, at a much younger age. And then, you know, to make a trip like this happen, as you can imagine, Tom, it takes many, many sponsors. And I believe here you guys are. Um, I believe we're up to about 85 right now. I see that puts a smile on your face. Um, but, you know, it's it's really unrealistic to think that any one person would have the resources or the time or the expertise to make a trip like this happen. So, you know, we rely on amazing sponsors that are philanthropists and, you know, trying to make a change in aviation. And it takes a huge community of people to do that. And as you can see, I'm going through here, you probably recognize some of these people. And um, the other thing is we have what we call our angels. And these are just people that, um, you know, want to make a difference in the world and they're not necessarily tied to companies, but they step out and they help us as well. And here's how you can contact us. So 
that's that's pretty much the presentation, Tom. And that's the same presentation I'll be giving at the AOPA Fredericks fly-in um, starting uh, next week in uh, Fredericks, Maryland. So you guys are kind of on the leading edge of getting this information. Awesome. I actually have a list of questions that I've made while you're going through the presentation. Okay. What licenses do you have and how long have you been flying? I know that you alluded that you waited until you were 47, but how kind of detail that for me. Yeah, actually, um, let me I, let me correct that. It's 45 is closer to the truth because, you know, I was going through all the different training. And then when I was finally out in the world, uh, it was a couple years later when I was doing that. But I have my VFR, IFR, um, so instrument flight rules, multi-engine, and commercial licenses. Awesome. What originally inspired you to fly? You know, I think everybody um, – sort of feels that connection to fly in some way, right? Maybe it's metaphorically, maybe it's um, actually in life. But uh, for me, ever since I was a child, I was fascinated with planes, you know, I built model planes and um, it just, um, I just felt a pull. And it wasn't until later in life when I had uh, the resources of time and money that I could actually make that happen. And that's when I wrote that first book called Flying Through Life, which shows people how to, uh, manifest the resources of time and money so they can pursue their passions. For me, it was flying. For other people, it could be, you know, climbing mountains, uh, traveling, whatever, whatever it might be. Is that book available on Amazon? It is. Yeah, flying through yeah. life. Okay. And the through is the T H R U, um, and here's what it looks like right here. Okay. Good move. What's a Zen moment? That's a great question. Um, you know, when you look in aviation, you, you find different books, you hear people present about how to be a better pilot, right? They'll teach you an instrument approach, how to fly in uh, IFR conditions. But what I wrote about in Zen Pilot was that trip around the world. But the Zen moments are the lessons that you learn from flying. And those are lessons that improve your life. One of them was um, when I was flying and having these problems with the Malibu, uh, I was thinking to myself, you know, this plane is trying to kill me. And in reality, I came to realize that it was actually the plane that was keeping me alive. So, you know, you can sort of project these things into your life. And I think there's valuable lessons that you learn from flying. And then you apply them in your life and your life improves. And generally, when your life is good, your flying is good, too. So it sort of comes full circle. Got it. So big question is, why? Why do you want to fly pole to pole? What's your mission? And how is this a world peace mission? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, you know, we wanted it to be bigger than aviation this time. And we wanted, like in the book, Flying Through Life, it talks about your impossibly big dream. And, you know, certainly people have had uh, other people that have said, hey, you can't do it. We wanted to show people that it could be done. And rather than just talk about it, actually go into the world and have impact and inspire people to go after those those things they thought were impossible. And, you know, the trip is timed almost perfectly because, you know, we're in a world that's divided now by politics, um, you know, racial tension. Uh, there's the economics that drive different countries. And this is just a... Um, a real life example of connecting people and connecting the poles. So our, our goal is to just show people what's possible. Got it. What is the greatest challenge that you're anticipating? Um, that's a good question. You know, on the plane side of it, the fuel is my biggest concern. And we've gone to such extreme lengths that the ferry pilot who's installing the fuel tanks has told me just to relax and that we have this covered and I can, you know, uh, be concerned about that, uh, about other things. The, the greatest challenge, though, I think, is how we're really going to get this out into the world and how we can get people inspired and watching. Um, you know, that involves uh, social media, involves organizations like the United Nations Association that I'll lecture for, the Explorers Club hoping to stop in different places and lecture for the women in aviation and really anybody who wants to hear about what we're doing. Um, I think that's a challenge because it's has so many moving pieces and there's so many people that are involved. 
Okay, I, you're, you kind of answered a question I was going to ask you is that you're doing this mission, you're doing it from a very altruistic and from a good point of view as far as I'm concerned, but you know, the big problem that anybody does doing something like this or owning a business is obscurity. So what can people do to help you make more people aware of what you're doing? Well, certainly social media is one way, right? Sharing some of the posts, um, talking about the trip, talking about what it means to be a citizen of the world for the world, right? Um, just, um, you know, when we started all this, we thought, wow, if we can just change the life of one person, then then maybe we've, you know, done what we set out to do. But now we're realizing that we have a chance to really reach out and touch the world. So I don't know if I've answered your question, Tom. I, I guess yeah, you I would are. say take an interest, you know, if it's something that that ignites some passion in you and and then go do what it is that excites you as well. Okay. What are some of the things that general aviation pilots could learn from you? Well, there's a lot of things in terms of preparation, right? Um, in terms of, you know, the plane, you can sort of see from our blogs that we've posted on um, AOPA that, you know, going through the plane in a meticulous manner, understanding the different systems, preparing yourself um, as an individual, right? Training, what you're eating, um, the survival classes, those are all things that relate to every GA pilot in the world. Got it. Got it. How will this trip inspire kids to pursue STEM education? What we're hoping to do with the trip is after it's completed, it's really the pay dirt for the trip. So we want a double step. And my goal is to take the plane around to different um, high schools, you know, by going to different airports and meeting with different groups and allow the kids and aspiring pilots to physically see the plane you know, that set the records over the poles to touch it, to get inside it, um, to see the panel lit off, which is better than the best video game I think that anybody could ever play, um, to, you know, experience the plane. And then also we're going to have simulators at these events. And we're hoping that the kids will be able to experience some of the things that I potentially could experience over the poles. So white out, loss of navigation, fuel gelling, landing on an ice runway. And, you know, we're hoping that that inspires them to actually, you know, touch and be a part of uh, the history that, that's just happened. I'm going to ask you a question that I think I know the answer to this is that, is there a third book going to come out of this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm already writing that, <laughs> that third book. Um, it's called Citizen of the World to the Ends of the Earth and Beyond. And the okay. beyond part is the spiritual component of the trip, just like Zen Pilot had its spiritual, you know, Zen moments. And there's the preparation part that I'm working on now. There's the actual trip, and then there's the lessons learned. And we're hoping that, you know, the first two books were really a stepping stone to something much greater. And we'll tackle some of the global issues that, um, you know, the planet's dealing with now. Got it. So for a shameless plug, tell me how my company, Arrow and Marine Tax Professionals, has assisted you in your journey. Journey. Well, you know, another one of your satisfied customers, the guy Mike Borden from High Performance is the one who recommended you. And um, basically, you guys helped me get um, the sales tax exemption on the planes. And that's a very, very complicated process. And I remember looking at the file, which is, you know, like this thick. <laughs> and um, way be way beyond my level of uh, patience and competence in terms of dealing with those sort of documents. But, you know, we got the exemption, the out-of-state exemption. Um, but there's been other ways, too. I remember because I was traveling uh, back and forth to Scottsdale, Arizona, where my family is, um, I got a letter from, uh, I, I forget who sent it, but somebody, the tax authority in in um Arizona, and they were trying to charge some extra fees saying the plane was maybe based out of there. And I turned that project over to you guys. And uh, again, you know, we had to submit a huge package and we were relieved of that 
uh, issue. And then there was, wasn't there a property tax issue too with the purchase of the plane? Oh, there's always a property tax issue in California. <laughs> yeah. So yes. But it was the company that was selling me the plane. And I remember I was getting documents and they wanted me to sign them and send them right away. And, you know, you were the first person that I called Tom. And I remember what you said, you go, don't send anything, don't sign anything. Let's figure this out before we respond. So yeah, that's just part of owning a plane, right? There's yep. some tax savings to be had. And then there's all these issues that seem to pop up. And like I said before, you can't be an expert on everything. So you have to ask for the help of people that do it every day. And that's certainly you guys. So from a standpoint of PR, how can people follow along with you on this trip? Is, are you going to be streaming live anything? Well, you know, right now we're talking to a group um, that wants to stream live from my ground stops to different high schools and uh, grammar schools around the U.S., um, I'm certainly going to be blogging through AOPA and also vlogging with them. And then the website, www.pole2poleflight.com, and the two is TO, will be a, a place where people can go. And then, of course, I mentioned all the different places on social media, everything from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Um, I know I'm forgetting one that I mentioned before. So yeah, it's going to be pretty easy to find us quite honestly. And then okay. also flight aware is because of the ADSB out uh, broadcasts that we're doing, we're going to be tied to them and they have 12 million followers and viewers. So we're waiting to see what that looks like, but we know flight aware is going to play a big part in this. Awesome. So I did a shameless plug for my company. So I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about the De Laurentiis Foundation. How will that affect aspiring pilots? And I think you have products as well. Yeah, we showed some of the products. You know, the De Laurentiis Foundation, um, we, we started about a year and a half ago. And the plan was we didn't want to have to go out and, you know, ask for things from people. We wanted to try and earn it and we wanted the foundation to continue for the next hundred years. So some of these products like the compression socks that help pilots, the DVD on overcoming the fear of flying, um, you know, the commemorative coins that are designed for pilots to give to aspiring pilots to carry with them until they become pilots and then they fly them forward to other aspiring pilots. You know, the technology and the flip sunglasses, I've used that countless times and that's awesome. We just, um, you know, we wanna make a difference in the world of aviation. And a lot of the companies that are trying to have impact now, Tom, they have to show a profit. But because we're a not-for-profit, we, our goal is not to make money, but to have impact in the world. And, um, you know, this is the, the way that we've chosen to do it. Awesome. Well, uh, I don't see any more questions coming in, so I think we've arrived at the end of this presentation. Thank you for giving us your personal time. Thank you for making this trip. I personally thank all of the people that have got involved to help you uh, because it scares the hell out of me. I, I don't have the nerve to do what you're doing. Um, and I know that you plan and you try to take into account on, in all your planning everything that can possibly happen. But Mr. Murphy still sits out there waiting for us all. So anyway, thank you very, very much for coming on and, and introducing your project to the world. And I've enjoyed working with you. Yeah, thanks for your interest in the project, Tom. You guys have always been big supporters. And, you know, certainly the financial element of a trip like this is, is critical to making it happen. And you guys uh, are definitely helping us every day with that. So thank you. Okay. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that's the end of the show. Thank you. <laughs>